know something wild? I just found out that it was <laughs> 12 40. I thought it was two o'clock. everybody welcome back to my channel my name is isis and this is isis is high <laughs> this whole room is isis is high I, I like to make a lot of research videos about topics that matter to me and sometimes i vlog if you like any of those things please feel free to subscribe and let's get into the video So we are going to be talking about Eloise Cabell, an amazing woman, and I'm so excited to be able to tell the story. I'm sure Native American folks have told her story, so I am just excited to round up as much research as I possibly could and tell it to you today. Miss Eloise Cabell was an entrepreneur, advocate, and member of the Blackfoot Nation. Eloise Pepion Cabell or Yellow Bird Women fought for government accountability and for Native Americans to have control over their own financial future. During her life, she's won countless awards, she founded the first Native American-owned bank, and she successfully won that class action lawsuit against the United States government. So in order to fully understand this story of suing the United States government, we have to kind of go back in time a little bit. The Dawes Act was a 19th century legislative attempt to solve what President Chester A. Arthur called the Indian problem. Western pioneers wanted American Indian lands, and while liberal Easterners wanted the American Indians to be happy, preferably to be happy away from them, the act's author or writer, Senator Henry Dawes, felt the solution laid in a Puritan work ethic. Put him on his own land, furnish him with little habitation, with a plow and a rake, and show him how to go to work to use them. The only way is to lead him out into the sunshine and tell him what the sunshine is for and what the rain comes for and when to put his seed in the ground. The Dawes Act, also known as the General Allotment Act, which means to like portion or section out, was signed into law in 1887. Dawes required that most reservation lands be broken into individual lots in the hope that separating or disbanding collective ownership would dissolve the power of the tribes, which they thought was counterproductive to Indian assimilation. The US government does not like when the people have as much power as American Indians did. And it meant that they wouldn't kind of, you know, assimilate into society the way that other, they kind of were able to push others to do the same. Other people of color to do the same. Getting back into my notes. <laughs> So the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or the BIA, agents reviewed the reservations and for the most part gave families 160 acres and single adults 80 acres. The extra lands, two-thirds of the area, were put up for sale. From the American Indian's point of view, Senator Dawes' experiment was a mockery. Not only did the government fail to give them a plow when it gave them their lot, it typically split their section into unmanageable lands, which I didn't even realize this, <laughs> this is what they did, which is kind of nuts. So they would give them 30 acres in like one section of maybe like timber or something, but then give them 50 acres of farmland like in a completely different section, like not even close to the section they already had were given so like they had these sections of land that were far apart from each other which is n stupid it's dumb and all that that did was guarantee that they couldn't work on certain lands and then they would have to sell it back to the united states government so the government took legal title of the portions of the allotments that they gave and began to lease the lands to settlers and later corporations indian farming supposedly the goal of the allotment actually declined by a third after the policy. In 1934, Congress forever terminated the policy, and from that point for forward, the allotted land that was not yet up for sale was forever to remain in trust with the federal government. And the income from the land, some about 11 million acres, was to be managed by the Bureau. They would be paid from any profit that happened from their land. That didn't happen. So the BIA also pledged to collect all of the profits that was given based off of, you know, the land that American Indians had or that they were leasing to other 
people and corporations and they were supposed to be put into individual Indian money accounts and managed by the BIA and then they would pay them in like regular installments maybe every month every week whatever they came up with I think it was supposed to be every month and that should have given them a steady income American Indians are not only forced to have to give their land up they can't even really have direct control over their money and then also even if a tribe did men like money from like a lawsuit or anything to that effect the United United States was in charge of that money as well. So investigations showed that the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the BIA paid the Indian land owners very randomly, if at all. And for decades, some Indians were sent checks for as little as eight cents which didn't make sense, of course, because you have all this land. It wouldn't make sense that you would only be getting eight cents. And from the beginning, Senator Henry M. Teller of Colorado, when he was seeing the Dawes Act in Congress for the Dawes Act, he predicted that the real aim of it was to get the Indians land and open it up for settlement, which is true. And as soon as that allotment or the portioning of the land began, about Indian owned acreage did begin to vanish. So within that first year, about 12 percent just disappeared and then my 1920 136 million acres held by the Indians when the Dawes Act was signed had shrunk to 72 million and then 17 million of that 72 was actually leased to white sellers. The BIA often was in violation of federal law because they've been ordered so many times to fix the issue and they failed to invest money, profited from these lands into interest bearing accounts, neglected to make sure that it was mixed when they did. Like that's very risk taking to only put money into one stock and not at least mix it up. There was also no policy or requirements that the borough notify or pay account holders when the agency lost their money. Officials just waited for the person to complain. The basic problem was the BIA's failure to follow basic accounting procedures in recording and updating accounts. As a result, the Bureau had little idea of what money came in, what should go out, or who should get it. Year after year, governmental auditors, people who kind of review finances, people's finances, told the BIA to settle the accounts and put in basic accounting procedures. And year after year, the BIA failed to do that. While generations of non-Indians have become rich, harvesting these resources of private Indian lands, which once included all the oil fields of Oklahoma, landowning Indians remain one of the nation's poorest citizens, joining the 23% of Indians in America living in poverty and the nearly 40% who are unemployed. Overall, American Indians are more than twice as poor as the average American. When I tell these stories, it's not always to make you feel happy or to make you feel sad, it's to Make sure that you're informed. American Indians have gone through so much and they still are going through so much. And it is incredibly important that with whatever kind of platform I have, whether that's big or small, that the, I bring awareness to that. So let's talk about the Blackfoot Nation specifically. So they are on the eastern edge of Glacier National Park and they're under the ice and limestone of the Rockies. They have about 1.5 million acres and that amount, pretty much the only amount that they have, they used to own most of Man Montana. And as beautiful as the land is, the Blackfoot tribe feel really isolated. They're about 120 miles from Great Falls. They're really far from an airport, a medical facility of any size, a college or university, or even like a shopping mall. People in need of nearly anything have to drive a long way. And that's hopefully because again, they live in the mountains. Hopefully it's not bad outside. And even on a somewhat warm February afternoon, it's really cold and there is always black ice for the most part. And sometimes it gets so windy that it blows at 90 miles an hour, which is insane. And it downs a lot of signs and billboards and has blown freight trains off the track, which is nuts. Eloise Catherine Pepion was, I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong, was born November 5th, 1945 on the Blackfeet Nation Reservation. This is her Blackfeet name. I'm not going to say that. 
because I respect the Blackfeet tribe. But in English, it is called Yellowbird Woman. She was the middle of nine children. She was the great great granddaughter of the respected mountain chief of the Blackfoot nation who refused to compromise with the US government in the 19th century. I like to think a little bit of him trickled down to me, she says. Her parents had a small ranch and like many reservation families at the time, they did not have electricity or running water. Three of her siblings did not survive childhood. Miss Cabell was a shy child and throughout her life, those who met her were surprised at her quiet, soft-spoken attitude. When she was four, her father managed to get a one-room schoolhouse built so that children would not have to go away to boarding school as her older brothers and sisters had done. She went to school there until leaving for high school 50 miles away. Mrs. Cabell grew up hearing stories and complaints from family and friends about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and she kept hearing a lot of stories about missing money. The story that impacted her most was that of her aunt and uncle when they requested money to pay for medical care. It was a harsh winter and her aunt had caught a ride on a horse-drawn wagon to the Blackfeet Agency, or the BIA Blackfeet Agency. They traveled 30 miles through the snow to get to the agency office. Outside the agency, several people were already waiting in chest-deep snow. Finally, an official came out and told them to come back tomorrow. Her aunt had to ask people for a place to stay overnight. When she returned the next day, the BIA agent told her that the checks would not be ready for another two weeks. They did not arrive until the following spring. So not two weeks, but that's like three to four months. The delay cost her uncle his life and her uncle died shortly after they arrived. My aunt died without ever seeing justice and her husband died from lack of medical care, she recalls. Because of the stories, she started looking into her own trust money at 18, but was told time and time again by BIA agents that she did not understand what she was looking at. The refusal spurred her on. If someone tells me something can't be done, I just get so mad I have to do it. After studying accounting at Great Falls Commercial College, Mrs. Covell went to the University of Montana to study business. While there, she interned as a clerk at the reservation's BIA office as part of a work study program. She saw many individuals come to pick up their checks. They would sit waiting on hard wooden benches all day or longer while the agent sat behind a teller window with bars. Once, she went into the agent's office to tell him to help the people and found him asleep on his desk. She spent two years at Montana State University before leaving to care for her mother, who was dying of cancer. After her mother's death, in 1968, she left the reservation and worked as an accountant at a television station in Seattle. There she met and married her husband, Alvin Cobell, another Blackfeet working in Washington, and had a son, Turk. The family returned to the reservation in 1971 when her father asked them to come home to help with the family ranch. Her brother had become paralyzed and the ranch had fallen into debt. In 1976, the Blackfeet Nation asked Cobell to become treasurer for the tribe. The position gave her the opportunity to hear the Blackfeet's concerns about their trust money. Some years, her fellow landowners would get checks, and sometimes they wouldn't. Most, including Miss Cabell, didn't even know and couldn't find out which lands were exactly theirs. Worse, some had received, had once received payments, but now they didn't and they had no idea why, and nobody wanted to really confront the BIA. Visiting one impoverished family after another, Cobell couldn't help but notice the oil wells pumping on their land, and the thousands of heads of cattle and fields of alfalfa, and the non-Indian tenants who worked on those lands were living in nice houses, driving new cars, while the Blackfeet landlords were living in cold, leaky government housing, largely unemployed and undereducated. In that position, she also fought with the BIA. She, so she asked them about the assets, and in this regard, the assets would be their land. The officials told her that she should learn to read a financial statement. She kept tracking errors and asking for explanations. At the same time, she worked to help tribes and individuals get financing without relying on the BIA. And in 1983, after the government shut down the only bank on the reservation, leaving residents without a bank within 30 miles. After attempts to convince other banks to open a branch on the reservation and that failing, Miss Cobell decided to open their own within the Blackfeet reservation. And she was told it wouldn't work 
And as she said before, don't tell her what to do. And she went back to school, became a banker, and in 1987, threw open the doors of the Blackfeet National Bank. It was the first bank in the country owned by an Indian tribe, and the bank began with a million dollars. She understood that reservation Indians often have trouble getting loans from traditional banks due to reservation land being held in a trust, meaning that it can't be a guarantee or deposit for a loan. Traditional banks are also often unwilling to deal with the possibility of tribal control, and a tribal bank could remedy the problem. While she was opening this bank, she also was looking into the government's handling of the trusts. And the more she investigated, the more she became convinced that the amount owed to Indian beneficiaries, both tribal and individual, was a lot. Collaborating with accountants from three other tribes, she entangled a very messy history of American Indian trust monies that were dumped into the U.S. Treasury's general fund, or it was used to buy weapons, or bailing out the savings in the loan industry. Pretty much they didn't treat them as funds that were specifically meant for the American Indians. They treated it as kind of like funds that they could use for anything else, which not only is that embezzlement, it's also like, it's not their money. So after she helped to fund and found the Blackfeet National Bank, which is now known as the Native American Bank, she stepped down as the bank director and served as the director of the Native American Community Development Corporation, or NACDC, <laughs> and that is the bank's nonprofit partner. So through that nonprofit, she worked with tribes and small businesses to create plans and financial literacy programs. And she did like a mini bank kind of curriculum or program for elementary schools. So while she's doing all this, she's also still, you know, tracking what the federal government is doing. She got together with a group of tribal finance officers and David J. Matheson and he was the deputy commissioner of Indian Affairs under the George H.W. Bush administration and together they started to get the attention of Congress. In the late 1980s she testified in congressional hearings about the trust accounts, the resulting 1992 House report that we talked about earlier, and then two years later, so in 1994, Congress passed the Indian Trust Reform Act and that appointed a special trustee to help with the problems in both tribal and IIM or individual Indian monies accounts. And President Clinton appointed Paul Homan, a respected banker who had run trust operations, who had cleaned up several troubled banks to help with making sure that the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs did what they were supposed to do, which means like implementing the act. Of course, that didn't happen. Homan found a type of chaos in the trust accounts he never imagined. Out of the 238,000 individual trusts his team located, 16,000 had no documents at all, and 118,000 were missing key papers. 50,000 did not even have addresses, meaning the money in the accounts never left the treasury. He resigned in 1999, <laughs> claiming that the Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt, prevented him from completing the work demanded by the act. So imagine this dude who has overseen many banks, right? Troubled banks, probably one of the worst of the worst. And to be so fed up and to be so done, you're getting so much pushback that you just can't even be bothered. She had a chance encounter with Attorney General Janet Reno. She met her at the Indian Banking Conference where they were both speakers. She told her about the problems with the trust fund and Reno asked her to write a letter requesting a meeting. Many months later, after calling her office pretty much every week, she finally got a meeting. So when she walked into that meeting, she was greeted by lawyers from the Departments of Interior, Justice, and the Treasury. Now, Eloise, 
one attorney told her. Don't you come in here with any false expectations. And so in response, she said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You've got to understand that every day, Indian people are dying in Indian communities without the money that they need for the basics of life. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. I tried to do the right thing, the way that you believe government should work. I really tried to follow the entire process. I went to the administration. I told them the stories. I told them what was happening. But through the years, they told many people, just sue us. And so, we just sued them. She contacted Dennis Gingold, a prominent banking attorney she had met four years earlier at a meeting called by a sympathetic official of the Federal Office of Management and Budget. Although Gingold thought they were meeting to discuss the banking and finances of Americans from India, there was more to that take. It was very dumb. When he heard Mrs. Cobell's story, he turned to the government officials in the room and said, I can't believe you guys haven't been sued. Well, honey, you've got a big storm coming. One of Cobell v. Norton's unnamed plaintiffs is James Mad Dog Kennerly. So when you're in like a court case, you have plaintiffs, the people who are suing, and you have the defendants, people who are, you know, defending themselves from getting sued. That's essentially what it is. James Mad Dog Ken Kennerly was a dude who should be a very wealthy Montanan because one of his inherited portions has about five working oil wells, but all that he gets is $30 a month. He lives in a house that is smaller than a modern walk-in closet and he says that the Department of Interior leases his lands for far less than the actual rate that they're supposed to get. He was asked what he would have done if he was able to get the money and he says that he'd have gone back to school <laughs> and become a lawyer and sued the BIA, which you know, fair. Over $6,000 of oil taken from my land, he said, and I get 89 bucks. Oh yeah, they'll even tell you they overpaid me. And the next check, they take it out. And he died without ever seeing justice. Another person was Mary Johnson. And she was an 87 year old woman with five oil wells also pumping from her land. They started drilling on her land in the 1950s and she's too poor to afford running water. She could see the oil wells and hear them pumping, but she never received any of that money. So the main thing that they just wanted was freedom from a government that has tried to make every decision for them from birth. So on June 10th, 1996, along with the Native American Rights Fund, she filed a class action lawsuit against the US Department of Interior for the mishandling of Indian trust funds belonging to over 300,000 individual tribal members. This lawsuit remains one of the largest class action lawsuits ever filed against the United States government. The lawsuit alleged, that's what they have to say to not get sued and I'm going to say it as well, that the BIA had been mishandling and abusing the Indian trust funds for over a century, leaving the Native Americans in poverty and without any alternatives. Their complaint did not ma demand money damages, even though, you know, they should have gotten it. They wanted the government to tell them where their money was and what they had done with it. And according to Cobell's forensic accountants, the government owed about $176 billion to individual Indian landowners, which is about $352,000 per plaintiff. Of course, because the federal government never wants to admit that they're wrong, both Clinton and Bush administrations used the amount of privilege and power and money that they had to delay the lawsuit from happening, spending hundreds of millions of dollars. In court, the Interior had the best lawyers from the Department of Justice, along with 35 of the country's most expensive private law firms. Mrs. Cobell, meanwhile, had funded her legal challenge with $11 million in grant money. So she expected the lawsuit to take about three years, and instead it took about 15. The department literally never kept track of the money that was going in and out. And so the lawyers, foolishly, who were defending the US government were like, no they weren't able to actually do that. A lot of the documents for the BIA and the individual accounts were kept in garbage bags, boxes that were like rottening and breaking down. Many of them had been destroyed by water and bitten by rodents. 
Some, the defendants claimed, could not actually even be given because they were possibly contaminated with hantavirus, which is a deadly disease carried by mice and rats. So three years after the case began, the defendants still hadn't even given any kind of documents, like to at least like produce five accounts. Barely could do that let alone the 300,000 people. Plaintiffs had argued that until a treasury official testified to the practice in 1999, trust records were routinely destroyed after six and a half years, meaning that there wasn't an accurate count to how much land is belonging to tribes and how much money is actually owed. When I saw that, I thought, I feel like you're not supposed to do that. The Department of Interior responded to its losses in court with a lot of tactics that the plaintiffs have seen as reactive and intimidating. So I think in the first part of the ruling, in the first part of the case, Judge Lambert, who we'll get into a little bit more, found the BIA was seizing land owned by Indian trustees and didn't actually tell them that they were taking the land and didn't even tell them like how much the value was or where it was even located and they were just selling it to oil companies and so he ordered the agency to stop doing that he ordered them to stop communicating with the plaintiffs regarding the sale conversion and transfer of land until they figured out how to better handle that and of course they took it as oh so we'll just not talk to them at all but only it was just supposed to be the sale of the lands so they shut down their website for a lot of a long period of time because the court wanted them to make sure that the trust information was secure they would also shut down the offices and phone lines telling a lot of american indians that they couldn't receive their royalty checks because of the lawsuit which is not true mrs cobell's name was published on the bia website like they literally doxed her which is nuts american indians would call her and blame her and she says it was the dumbest thing that they could have done because she just explained what was going on with them. Some began to wonder if the suit was even worth it, particularly because the federal government was pouring in millions of federal dollars, dollars that they could have just given back to American Indians to defend the lawsuit. And some even started to say that Mrs. Cobell was just in it to get a big check. In 2003, Congress asserted, like, put itself within that lawsuit by attaching to an omnibus budget and Iraq appropriation bills. Omnibus budgets are budgets that, for the most part, have a specific intention or a specific goal. Politicians use that all the time to insert other random things, either for their the people who are giving money to them, to be quite frank, or for, like, really big progressive policy changes. So they put in things in those bills to delay the actual accounting that was needed for the Department of Interior with, that the BIA needed to do. It also attempted to cut the salary of court-appointed investigators and then permitted Secretary Gail Norton, who was the Secretary of the Department of Interior at the time, to use discretionary funds so she could use those funds to do whatever they wanted but mostly to pay for the private attorneys hired by all past and present interior employees appearing in the case for 10 of those 15 years in court the presiding judge was federal judge royce c lamberth a republican from texas and he was appointed by President Ronald Reagan. On December 21st, 1999, after a six-week trial, District Court Judge Lamberth issued an opinion. It would be difficult to find a more historically mismanaged federal program than the Individual Indian Money Trust. As the trustee admitted on the eve of the trial, so the day before the trial, or before the trial began, it cannot render an accurate accounting to the beneficiaries contrary to a specific statutory mandate and the centrally old obligation to do so. It is entirely possible that tens of thousands of IIM trust beneficiaries should be receiving different amounts of money, their own money, than they do today. Perhaps not, but no one can say, which is the crux of the problem. The court held that the defendants had failed to meet their responsibility to provide account holders with accurate accountings and had not kept proper records for their accounts. The court ordered the defendants to fulfill those duties and provide it with quarterly reports on their progress. Plaintiffs should take great satisfaction in the stunning victory that they have achieved today on behalf of the 300,000 plus Indian beneficiaries of the IIM Trust. But 
the lawsuit dragged on for another 10 years. So Judge Lamberth was known for his take no bull attitude and he, as I said before, was a Reagan appointee who had been in charge of civil litigation for the United States for years before and he was definitely not a liberal. I don't think Reagan would appoint a liberal. But his long government experience had made him wise to the ways of government agencies and their attorneys. The judge already had a reputation for impatience with government dodging, but in this lawsuit, his frustration reached a new level. It really did. During the case, he held all of the secretaries of interior that kept being replaced in contempt of court, meaning they weren't following kind of the orders of the court and other government officials for failing to initiate a court-ordered historical accounting. He found that they inexcusably failed to make progress toward compliance with their trust responsibilities and continued to destroy records or failed to properly maintain them or lie to the court about their progress. For those harboring hope that the stories of murder, dispossession, forced marches, assimilationist policy programs, and other incidents of cultural genocide against the Indians are merely the echoes of a horrible, bigoted government past that has been sanitized by the good deeds of more recent history, this case serves as an appalling reminder of the evils that result when large numbers of the politically powerless are placed at the mercy of institutions engendered and controlled by a politically powerful few. It reminds us that even today, our great democratic enterprise remains unfinished. And it reminds us, finally, that the terrible power of government and the frailty of the restraints on the exercise of that power are never fully revealed until government turns against the people. In 2005, Judge Lamberth ordered the government to include with any communication to the hundreds of thousands of plaintiffs a statement that all of the information about their accounts was unreliable. And this is what his opinion said. After all these years, our government still treats Native American Indians as if they were somehow less than deserving of the respect that should be afforded to everyone in a society where all people are supposed to be equal. Regardless of the motivations of the creators of the trust, one would expect, or at least hope, that the modern interior department and its modern administrators would manage it in a way that reflects our modern understandings of how the government should treat people. Alas, our modern interior department has time and time again demonstrated that it is a dinosaur. The morally and culturally oblivious hand-me-down... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. The morally and culturally oblivious hand-me-down of a disgracefully racist and imperialist government that should have been buried a century ago, the last pathetic outpost of the indifference and ankle centrism we thought we had left behind. I just want to remind you, this dude is not liberal and is a Reagan appointee. The government, of course, had appealed the order or just kind of took the case to a higher court because they didn't agree and asked for him to be removed <laughs> because they told him he was pretty much being mean because he was calling out racism. And they used his language in the written opinions that he had. And the Court of Appeals agreed. And they said that he professed hostility. They found that he was so extreme as to display clear inability to render fair judgment. But they did still agree that the United States was still at fault for how it handles American Indians' trusts, and the Court of Appeals ordered the case assigned to a new judge. And so in 2008, they got Judge James Robertson, and he still even found that, you know, the federal government still was not doing the job that they should have done. And providing an accurate and complete accounting would cost as much as $12 billion. And the money in the accounts was only about $2 billion. So they would need to find $10 billion somewhere. And so a complete accounting would be nuts. That being the case, he declared that there had to be something else that could be done. And so a few months later, he decided that the U.S. would pay them the plaintiffs, $455 million. Although this covered the money the defendant said was missing from the trust fund, it did not include the money lost due to mishandling or withholding of funds, which we had said earlier could be to like hundreds of billions of dollars. In 2009, the Court of Appeals had reversed that judgment because they were like, no. Ruling that the district court's order failed to hold the United States to its trust responsibilities. Finally, in 2008, that same year when Barack Obama was elected, he kept his campaign promise to bring a just and fair resolution to the lawsuit. And six months after negotiations and 13 years or 15 years of litigation, Mrs. Cobell and her lawyers agreed to a 
$1.4 billion settlement. In November of 2010, Congress approved the settlement, and in December of 2010, President Obama made the announcement. After years of delay, this bill will provide a small measure of justice to the Native Americans whose funds were held in a trust by a government charged with looking out for them. On June 21st, 2011, the Federal District Court in Washington, D.C. gave it the final stamp of approval. So two years still it took for people to get their money. And even then, they didn't get it until December. So within that settlement was 1.5 billion for members for the 300,000 folks, 1.9 billion for a land consolidation program, so buying and combining the land, the rest of the land, so that it could be under tribal ownership, 60 million for a college scholarship for Indian youth, and that was done at Mrs. Cobell's request, and that can be used towards American Indians go to college or go to a vocational school and it's called the Indian Education Scholarship Fund which I will try to make sure I link down below. The settlement was the largest government settlement ever awarded in the history of the United States. Mrs. Cobell was given two million and her lawyers were given 99 million. I'm trying to remember how many people were involved. <laughs> But people thought that 99 million was a lot for the lawyers. And so her response was that it is not perfect and I do not think it compensates for everything that was lost, but I do think it's fair and it is reasonable and that is what matters. A fair resolution has been achieved. It was also like 13 to 15 years of being in court. A lot of the elders who were involved in the suit had already died and some were still alive, but of course we're still struggling. It made more sense to settle now, especially with that bigger, that much bigger of a number than to keep going for even longer. At the time, she didn't know what she was gonna do with the money. And she said maybe she would do three or four things or maybe 20 things on her list, because again, she got about two million. She said she'll figure it out sometime and she wanted to do something fun. Her son, Turk, he said, we're obviously proud of her, but we're glad it's over. My mother is tremendously relentless when it comes to doing what she believes is right. Maybe now she can finally enjoy a normal life again and get something she hasn't had, rest. So six months after the signing ceremony, just four months after the court's final approval, she went to the Mayo Clinic for an operation for cancer. On October 16th, 2011, less than a year after President Obama signed it, the cancer killed her. The Department of Interior flew its flags at half-mast in her honor. Her lead attorney, Dennis Gingold, said at her funeral, she saw the finish line, but she never crossed it. Over the Christmas holidays of 2012, the first round of checks, or Eloise checks, as many refer to them, were sent out. The checks were about 1,000 to 2,000 per person. Many used their funds to buy Christmas gifts for their family or to pay for heat, food, and medical care. Some gave a portion of their funds to help others in the name of Eloise Cobell. On November 16th, 2016, President Obama honored her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and Montana Governor Stephen Bullock issued a 2015 proclamation. He declared it to be Eloise Cobell Day. The Cobell Scholarship, named in her honor, is a merit and need-based scholarship to support students enrolled in U.S. federally recognized tribes who are seeking post-secondary degrees. University of Montana has an Eloise Cobell Land and Culture Institute, the Learning Center for Students focusing on collaborations with tribal colleges and storytelling traditions in Native American culture. Today, Blackfoot Nation has more than 200 businesses, 80% of them American Indian owned, and most launched with loans from the banks Mrs. Cobell helped to start. The day before her funeral, the local radio station had played her favorite singer, Elvis Presley, all day in her memory. On October 22nd, thousands gathered in the Browning High School gym to mourn and remember her. The Crazy Dog Society, together with uniformed Blackfeet veterans, had escorted the casket to the high school the day before, stopping four times to sing and pray for the lost Blackfeet warrior. A line of cars several miles long traveled the 30 miles to the family ranch where she was buried during Catholic and Blackfeet prayers. After her death, a small piece of paper remained taped to her office computer. And it read, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And that's it. As I said before, it was really an honor to be able to read her story. Thank you all for listening. 
are watching. I'll see you all next week or in the next video that I'm about to record. <laughs> Bye.